Hi, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, this is the Pandemic Baseball Book Club's interview series. And joining me today, my name is Mark Healy. I'm the author of Gotham Baseball, New York's all-time team. And uh, today joining me is Dan Sloshberg. He is a national baseball writer for Forbes.com and, like myself, a former member of the Associated Press. So, Dan, I know you have a couple of books coming out, but before we get to them, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. Great to be with you. Uh, and, you know, full disclosure, folks, Dan and I know each other. We've known each other a long time. We don't get to see each other, but uh, we certainly have uh, spoken with each other many times uh, through our mutual friends like Marty Appel, who did the foreword for my book. And um, yes. before, before, I get to, uh, before I get to both books, you, you have written a voluminous amount of books. You've written 38 books. You're someone who has certainly um, seen and heard everything uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to baseball. And when we, when we look at the possibility of the season almost, almost here, it's almost actually going to start, are you confident that we're going to get the full 60 games in the playoffs and that this, we're actually going to see baseball this season? I think we're going to see baseball, but I can't be confident that we'll complete the whole thing because there are too many outbreaks right now, and they've got to calm the situation down. The other thing is that, obviously, like myself, like you, like all of the members of the Pandemic Baseball Book Club, we all are, you know, I, I don't think any of us saw this coming, where, you know, basically we wouldn't be able to do the very thing that we all love to do, which is going to book signings and meeting with people and talking about our books and answering questions. Because I know you. you. I know you love to talk about baseball. You talk about it on social media. You'll talk about it on the phone. I know that that's what you love to do. This oh, yeah. has been a challenge. So what was going through your mind when the possibility started to look real that things would shut down? I was actually at spring training in Florida. I was at the last game in Bradenton. That's the day on March 12th that they announced it and happened during the game. And what, the night before that, or the day before that, I was in Fort Myers for a game with the Twins at their ballpark. And they had a game scheduled for Thursday night. That game was canceled. So I was actually at the last game for both the Twins and the Pirates ballparks. Wow. And when that happened, it was like the end of the world just about the end of the world. I mean, I couldn't imagine how long it was going to be, but I knew it was going to be longer than two weeks. You know, I, I know how hard it's been for me. So I can even, you know, when you have two books coming out and two books to promote and two books to talk about and two books that you certainly want to, and I want to get to the titles of the books, of course, uh, I know, uh, and a lot of people know that the Ron Blanc book, uh, Designated Hebrew, is a book that I loved when I first read it. Um, and your new book is the New Baseball Bible, Notes, Nuggets, and Lists, and Legends from Our National Pastime. Let's talk about uh, designated Hebrew first. Uh, okay. I think that Ron, uh, you know, and Ron, as you know, has just joined social media and is enjoying yeah. it very much. Um, I got a nice baseball. I got a nice birthday greeting from him the other day. Um, he loves, he just loves to talk about baseball. He loves to talk about life. He's a great guy. Did you have that experience with him when you were, when you were writing the book? Yes, very much so. In fact, I've had him on a baseball theme cruises that I did. And there's a photograph of Ron with me on one of those baseball theme cruises in the new baseball Bible. He was just a super guy. He's always been that way. And he's kind of like in real life, he's the real life Little Abner. If you remember the cartoon strip, Little Abner? Sure. And when he, managed, when he managed in the Israel League, his team won the pennant, which is kind of amazing. But he didn't know anybody's name. Everybody was like, big guys on first, big guys on second. It was like <laughs> Abbott and Costello. It was incredible. <laughs> that was his birthday greeting to me. Happy birthday, big guy. <laughs> there you go. I'm laughing when you say that. <laughs> um, what, what were the challenges for, you know, 
what were the challenges for Ron when he first came into the league, aside from being, you know, the pressure of being a number one draft pick, the pressure of playing in New York? Um, what, were his, what, what do you think were his biggest challenges when he came into the big leagues? It's a good question with an easy answer. He was billed as the Jewish Mickey Mantle, and he was supposed to do all the things that Mickey Mantle did, except he was Jewish, and obviously there's a big Jewish population in New York, and the Yankees viewed him as somebody that would really increase attendance at the time. Remember, in 67, the Yankees were down and out. They were not a very good team. This was way before George Steinbrenner came into the picture. So his biggest challenge was living up to that, and he was always hurt, and he was always platooned because he was a left-handed hitter. So that really held him back. You know, the, I always love the title, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, you fight with your publisher about your title, you fight with your editors about your headlines, you know, as, an, as, as, as a former reporter and now an editor, you know, I see it from the other side. Uh, designated Hebrew is such a great title. Uh, was it something that you came up with? Was it something that he came up with? Actually, it originated because Dick Schaap, Years after Bloomberg retired, Dick Schaap said to Ron, what was it like to be the first DH? And he said, what do you mean, designated Hebrew? And Dick <laughs> Schaap said, that's a book. There you go. That's where it came from. Well, that's no surprise. The late, great Dick Schlapp was just, he was just, he was, he was great, Dick Schaap. You know, I just, in fact, you know, it's funny. Uh, you'll get a kick out of this. You know I'm a Met fan. I know you're a Braves fan. Um, I just I read for the very first time ever, Jimmy Breslin's, you know, can anyone here play this game? And, of course, Dick Schlapp was the editor for it and everything. But what a great book. It was this little book. I never read it. And I don't know. Somebody gave it to me and said, would you be interested in this? And I said, you know, well, you know, of course I would, you know. I had even forgotten that it existed. But what a great little book that was, you know. And yes. just I had to mention it when you mentioned Dick Schlapp's name because he's been – you know, guy was such a legend, and I, I had no idea that he was the one that was the, you know, you know, the, 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 the I guess, the creator of the title or the, the inspiration for the title. You know, that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, here's the other thing, too. I, I don't think people realize um, when they talk about Ron, Ron Bloomberg, and that is he's not a New York guy. He's, not, he's from Georgia, right? And so that's, I think, the thing that really, when they hear him talk for the first time, you know, a guy's such a legend, you would think that you would see more of him or hear more of him. But I think every time that people see him, wow, I didn't know he was from the South. Um, did that prepare him for the challenge of New York being, you know, the fact that um, as a Jewish man in Georgia, being a little challenging at a time when maybe that wasn't the easiest thing to be in the South? Well, he did tell me that when he played as an amateur in the area of Stone Mountain, which was a Ku Klux Klan hotbed, oh, yeah. he said everybody on his team belonged to the Ku Klux Klan, and they knew he was Jewish, but he was the best player, so they never bothered him, which was great. But when he came to New York, he was embraced by all these Jewish people, and he got free meals at all these delis and they even named a sandwich after him at the stage deli. So he loved coming to New York and having bagels and pastrami and the usual stuff. Who wouldn't? The designated hitter was supposed to be, um, you know, the DH was supposed to be an experiment, something that Charlie O'Finley came up with, I believe, yes. Um, why do you think it, do you think that somebody like Ron, who was such a character, uh, Orlando Cepeda, I believe, was was uh, in Boston as the DH. Yes. Um, was it because of those characters, because of the, their, the, the way that they went about their business? Do you think that's why the DH stayed in vogue in the American League and, and was not, a, was not a, an, an experiment and it turned out to be the standard? Well, it did prolong the careers of a lot of big stars, including Hank Aaron, Harmon Killebrew, Billy Williams, and others, and that helped. But you know, teams had DHs that were really over the hill players. They couldn't play the field anymore. They could still hit a little bit. I mean, Hank Aaron was kind of sad at the end. Willie Mays 
although he wasn't at DH, but it was kind of sad to watch him play at the end, too. I'm sure you remember him falling down in center field during the World Series for the Mets. So, I do. I, you know, it's one of my yeah. first baseball memories. And, you know, it's funny. I wrote about it in, in his chapter uh, because he was the one that, you know, he said his legs, it went, once his legs went, he was never the same. And yep. you're right. If he had had the ability over the last four or five years of his career to be a DH rather than, because his eye was always fantastic. Uh, even his first year with the Mets, when I was going through some of the stats, because there's always been this thing where Willie Mays, you know, when he came to the Mets, he fell apart. He had like a 370 or 380 on-base percentage in 1972 with the Mets, which is, you know, really, really good, you know, for a team that had no offense at all. Um, you know, so you're right. It, it would have certainly did uh, extend uh, a lot of guys' careers. Uh, but now, as a National League fan, uh, as I am, how do you feel about the designated hitter for this 60-game, uh, you know, the 60-game season? Because a lot of people seem to think that, um, even though they're saying that it's only for this year, do you think it's going to a? Do you think it's going to be the norm going forward? And how do you feel about it? Well, I'm a fan of pitchers hitting and the old school and the sacrifice bunt and pinch hitting. And I'll give you one name, Tony Cloninger, July 3rd, 1966, the first player, let alone pitcher, in National League history to hit two grand slams in one game. I like to see pitchers do some things that are amazing. Rick Wise hit two home runs while pitching a no-hitter. Madison Bumgarner, just a couple of years ago, two home runs on opening day. I like to see that kind of stuff. And, and you know, you look at Warren Spahn, you know, way, way back. Warren Spahn hit home runs in 17 consecutive seasons. That's unbelievable. That's wild. And that's why he had 363 wins, but 382 complete games. He stayed in the game because he could hit. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, and, and, and that's a great segue because as a National League fan, I'm right there with you. I love – the hit and run. I love the bunting and stealing. I love the sacrifice. I love when, I love when a manager has the ability and the tactical mindset to play that kind of chess in a game, especially when you have a dominant pitcher on the mound and you're trying to get his pitch count up and you're trying to get to the bullpen, especially if it's a bullpen that doesn't necessarily pitch very well. And you have to make decisions on whether or not you're going to let the pitcher hit. You've got to make decisions on whether or not you're going to pinch hit. It changes the entire strategy of the game. However, I will say this. I think that a lot of that stuff is being ripped out of the game by today's GMs and today's managers. I, I see a lot of, you know, if you don't hit a home run, you strike out and everybody, you know, just goes back. You know, you would think that the game would be quicker because of that. It's not. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the point where I say to myself, yes, I agree with you vehemently that that's the kind of baseball I like. But I really believe that today's game is not, you know, is not about that. They want the instant gratification. They don't care if it's chess. You know, they'd rather play, you know, 10 games of checkers than one game of chess. So that's, that's a little disheartening. And I, I hope that we, I hope this isn't a repeat of the AL's experiment, you know, uh, yes. and we're not stuck with DH in, in National League Baseball uh, going forward. Yeah, yeah. Let, me mention, let me mention something else, Mark. This is something very few people know. Sandy Koufax told me his toughest hitter was Lou Burdett. Lou Burdett hit three game-winning home runs against Sandy Koufax. <laughs> I did not know that. And by the way, there's a guy who should be in the Hall of Fame, too, Lou Burdett. Well, that's, that's one of those, you know, that's one of those things that when I used to host the radio show, you know, we could talk four hours about guys like Lou Burdett, who belong in the Hall of Fame. We yes. could talk hours about guys like Gil Hodges, that it's a complete, yes. it's a complete, uh, you know, travesty. The fact that the Hall of Fame can't adapt to have a category of baseball career, you know, combining the manager and the player, you know. Joe Torre was able to get in because of his ability as a borderline player 
you know, he's a borderline Hall of Famer as a player. Yes. And certainly with, with what he did with the, with the Yankees, that certainly qualified him and got him in. But people forget, it wasn't the writers that put Joe Torre in. It was the committee. That's you right. Know? The veterans. And, right. Right. So, so, you know, Buck O'Neill. I mean, again, another guy who should be in the Hall of Fame when you look at his playing career in the Negro Leagues and then you look at oh, his manager sure. and being a scout and being a coach and just being the most wonderful man I've ever met in my life. Um, yeah. You know, so, so we could do hours on that. But I really want to get to – um, I want to get to designated Hebrew a little bit more. I want to get to uh, the new baseball Bible. You know, when, when people say, wait a minute, I read designated Hebrew. How can you say it's a new book for 2020? What do you, what, what's your response to that? It's been updated. There's new material in it. I talked to Ron at the end of the 2019 season. It's a, it's a brand new book. It's everything's been updated. That's and he great. talks about baseball today, things like that. But I've got to tell you my favorite story from the book because it's so apropos of Ron Goldberg, and it's still true today. He told me when he was in the minor leagues, he saw a sign in a restaurant window that said, 72-ounce steak free if you can eat it in an hour. <laughs> and yet not only had to eat the steak, but potatoes, some green vegetable, a roll, everything. He did it three times. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's amazing. I've never seen anybody with an appetite like Ron Bloomberg's. Wow. That's not, not an ounce of fat on the guy either. No, he's not. He's in fantastic shape. I, I you know, when I met with him a couple of years ago, uh, I had met with him and Archansky and we were sitting down and we had lunch. And uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was, uh, I was impressed because I'm quite a, uh, a competitor at the dinner table as well. You know, <laughs> I'd have to, uh, you know, if it was a, uh, if it was an Olympic sport, I, I'd be right up there. But, um, but he's, such a, he's such a – he's such a uh, – the thing I like about Ron is that he has such a perspective, you know, such yes. a healthy perspective about his career. You know, some people would look at his numbers, especially today when they, when they look at numbers and they, they make the numbers the man and the man the numbers. And I always want to look past the numbers. I want to look at what were the conditions, what was the lineup, you know, what kind of – what was the era of, of the, you know, what, what, what was the era the player was playing? And I think that the era that he played in was so weird. And that team that he played on was so unYankee like in, in so many ways. When you think about the transition of where it was going and how, you know, again, having to play for a guy like George Steinbrenner, you know, yeah. people, people, and Billy people, Martin. people think of George, uh, you know, as this in later in life when he was the lion of baseball, you know, in, in, in Bill Madden's book, you know, they don't realize that this is a guy that, you know, after Dave Rigetti was the rookie of the year in 1981, he sent him to the minors the next year because he wasn't happy with his ERA, you know. Um, uh, George was, was a, you know, George was a guy that, that was challenging to play for because there was no buffer as much as Billy wanted to be a buffer, as much as Bob Levin wanted to be a buffer. Um, how was Ron's relationship with George? Did they get along? Did he like the fact that uh, Ron was such a, was, was such a, you know, ebullient personality? He had no particular problems with George. He had problems with Billy Martin, big time problems with Billy Martin. He said Martin platooned him for no apparent reason because he hit pretty well, even against left-handed pitching. And he also blamed Martin for the injury that really ended his career. Martin put him in left field during a spring training game, and Bloomberg crashed into the wall and suffered a serious shoulder injury, and was out basically for two years. And he blames Billy Martin for that because he was a first baseman, or a DH. But, you know, Bloomberg blames Billy for that. Does, does Billy think, I mean, does, 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 Ron think that Billy was anti-Semitic and that was part of the, did he think that that was the reason or that he, they, they just, the personalities didn't click? Personality class primarily. He did mention some other teammates that were more anti-Semitic. He said one player's wife, I'm not going to mention the player's name, but you probably know. The first day that Mara Bloomberg, who was Ron's first wife, went into the wives section at the ballpark, this other player's wife said, oh, I thought you were going to have horns. Oh boy. Oh. And and what's crazy about it, what's crazy about that 
is that if you talk to somebody now, they'd be like, that didn't happen. That's crazy. That, you know, like, and that, that's what's, people think there's only, sometimes people think there's only one kind of prejudice or one kind of, of, of racism, that it only applies, you know, or there's plenty to go around, you know, there's, there's plenty of people, like for myself, now I, when I, I went to all boy Catholic uh, high school, I went to Catholic school, uh, uh, you know, in grammar school from one, first grade to eighth grade, uh, but I went to Queens College. And when I went to Queens College, all of a sudden, for the first time, I mean, it wasn't like I hadn't ever seen a Jewish person or, you know, I think my dad at one point was working for a couple of professors from Brooklyn College and they were Jewish, so, you know, I would help them out. So it wasn't like I'd never met a Jewish person before. When I went to Queens College, like pretty much everybody was Jewish, you know? <laughs> and it, you know, it's like different cultures, you know? You, you just, you either adapt or you are, or you fear it. Um, and, you know, a lot of people seem to be able to adapt, some people can't. So I, I think sometimes people try to minimize what Jewish ball players went through, you know? And I think that why it's so important that, you wrote a book about uh, about Ron uh, in that sense because you know people don't understand like even you know Koufax went through it uh, you know uh, Greenberg uh, went through it Hank Greenberg um, and that's why uh, Greenberg and Jackie Robinson had that you know they had that synergy with the two of them because he was able to he was able to commiserate on a level that. I, I'm not sure that that same level of people being able to commiserate right now in the game, uh, in sports, because um, everybody's like, well, no, it's, it's, it's my experience was worse. You know, how could you compare your experience to my experience? But we've all been in those kinds of situations at some level in our life. So well, I'm glad, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned Greenberg because in the movie 42, there was a major oversight that was, it was just left out of the movie, and it bothered me. In 1947, Jackie's rookie year, Greenberg was with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he played first base. The first time that Jackie reached base when Greenberg was there, Greenberg said to Jackie, I went through a lot of prejudice and discrimination myself. If you have any problems, I want you to come talk to me. I will help you. That should have definitely been in the movie 42. It was not. Uh, there was a few things. I, I mean, I love the movie. Don't get me wrong. I did, too. I, I did love it. Uh, I love the um, uh, Bowman who played the role. He's excellent, Chadwick Bowman. Uh, I love the Ebbets Field and, and the recreation of the stadiums. And, you know, I loved uh, the kid that played uh, Pee Wee Reese. But, you know, Ralph Branco wasn't the player that, you know, was his best pal. I mean, you know, I mean, Branco was, but, you know, I. I, I've met Frank. I love Frank, uh, and I yeah. think he was alive. I think he was alive at the time uh, when they did, did the did the movie tour. Yeah. So it was like, you know, it was nice to have somebody who was alive that actually played with Jackie. But the script was a little, you know, they made they took they certainly took liberties. You know, um, let's talk about uh, the new baseball Bible okay. because it's it's a book that, in my mind, is perfect for today's audience because it has a lot of lists. It has a lot of tidbits of information. It's got a lot of, you know, hey, I didn't know that, which, which is, you know, I can't speak for every baseball fan, but for the baseball fans that I know, they love stuff like that. And, and I think the big, the big thrill, I think for, for when you write something like that is even someone like you, who has written so many books, who has written about the sport for so many years, how many, there had to be things that you were writing in the New Baseball Bible that even you had one of those moments where, hey, I didn't know that. Many, many of the things I put right. in the book. The whole advantage here, Mark, is, is I use a sidebar format. You know, one line here, one paragraph here, and there are over a thousand different things like that throughout the book. And the idea was to make it unusual, put in things that nobody knows, things never published before previously. And that also goes for some of the pictures, some of the artwork, some of the charts. And that's why I say this is probably the most unusual baseball book ever published. 
I, I've always been a fan of, you know, you know, I would never, you know, you call yourself a historian, you know, you better know your stuff, you know. And I remember yeah. when I came up with the idea for Gotham Baseball, it was all based on the fact that I did not know that Jack Chesbro was the all-time winner, you know, all-time leader in wins for a season with 41. I had no idea. Um, and then I started to read about him, and I'm like, you know what, there should be a place for fans of New York baseball to, like, kind of pick and choose all these different facts. But what you did is you did it for all of baseball with the New Baseball Bible. You've done it. You cover everything. And just for my book, and I was doing the research, I mean, I was just doing research about four teams. You were doing research for all 30 teams, teams that don't exist anymore, teams that have moved, where there's not a ton of information um, as much as people would think. Like when I was looking for stuff on Joan Payson, I mean, that was like the hard, one of the hardest things I've ever done was trying to get information on Joan Payson because she wasn't in the paper all the time. She didn't talk to the press all the time. What were some of the hardest nuggets of information that, like what were the things that were mo the most challenging to you? Very good question. And I've never been asked that before, actually. The hardest things were when different sources gave different answers for the same question. In other words, let's talk about the Negro League for a second. The record keeping was very erratic. Right. Teams played strange schedules. Some of them were, you know, barnstorming games. Some of them were exhibition games. And they kind of got all jumbled into one. They really weren't covered like the white players were, the white leagues were. And therefore, I would check different sources, and they would give me different, different things. So basically, I did a two out of three rule. If two sources agreed, I would use that, because that's really the only thing I had to go on. In addition, record keeping for the major leagues early in the century wasn't great either. And that's why Sabre, Society for American Baseball Research, has really gone back and looked at some of these records. And some of the baseball stats have been changed because of Sabre research finding an extra base hit for Ty Cobb or an extra win for Walter Johnson, things like that. You know, before computers, things were very different. Well, I remember, you know, and again, I'll, I'll mention this again because, uh, you know, we're both uh, alum, alumnus of the Associated Press. And, you know, I, I write about uh, being a member of the AP in my book because I, I always talk about uh, as much as I got frustrated when I left, I really loved working there because there are still I mean, so many legends of people that have worked at the Associated Press. Uh, some that I worked for, some that I met, uh, you know, when they would come around. And, you know, um, I think that people don't understand, they have no concept of the amount of media guys that we used to have to go through to find the simplest statistic uh, for, let's say, you know, I, I used to write a lot of baseball previews and I used to have to find the, and this was before baseballreference.com was a thing, you used to have to find what a player's record was against a certain pitcher. What was his, you know, what was his uh, lack of success or success? Like, you know, like, you know, for instance, uh, you know, uh, Edgardo Alfonso against Randy Johnson, right? There's no website. There was no website to go look that up. You had to go through, hopefully you'd find it in the Mets media guide. But if you didn't, then you had to find the Arizona Diamondbacks media guide or whoever was pitching for, Randy Johnson was pitching for at that particular time. And let's be honest, some media guide, uh, some media guides were better than others. Um, but do you remember those days where you had to like go through 60 different things just to find a sentence? Very much so, because I'm a guy who collects all those media guides, and I like to have the printed ones rather than going on. I'm an old school guy. But I'm glad you mentioned Randy Johnson, because that brings up one of my favorite stats. The only guy that had two home runs in a game against him twice was Chipper Jones, and he did it exactly a year apart. Exactly. Now, you're a Braves fan. Did you know that before you wrote it? Oh, no, I didn't realize it until I wrote it. That, that is, and that's, I think, when people say, how can you sit there and write a book? And you've written, what, 38 of them now? Yes. Um, when people say, you know, how can you sit there for hours and hours and write thousands of words? Um, 
I'm telling you, I love it because I love, and yeah, sure, we have days where we can't write and we, we, we're, we have a chapter that's kicking our asses and we don't want to, and we just have to walk away. But I, I, I'm telling you, when you have those aha moments or those I didn't know that moments, it makes the, the four hours that you sat there to write that, you know, that write that chapter, or write that paragraph, you know, um, is that your process too? That you just, you know, you just have, it's so, enjoy I mean, you have to enjoy it if you've written 38 books, right? Uh, yes. And I love baseball and I love writing, but there are two secrets. Number one is I don't follow any other sport. I don't know anything about football, basketball, hockey, NCAA, Final Four. I've never seen any of those things. I've never seen the Super Bowl. I really don't like football. Really? But I love, I love baseball. And I follow baseball 12 months a year. And I save things. I save little things that I find in the newspaper. Little things from the old sporting news. Anything I can come up with. And I'll write them down. Now I can put them in the computer. But in the old days, I kept scrapbooks. You know, the old marble composition books sure. that you had in school. I would keep scrapbooks and paste things in there, scotch tape stuff together. And that's where I got a lot of the material for the new baseball Bible. And, and that's... That's what makes, you know, there's such a personal, when I read a write, when I read somebody like you, and I've, you know, I've read a lot of your stuff, and, you know, you have, you have moments where you meet people and you read their stuff, and, you know, you're like, oh, you know, it's not really my thing, but I like the person, or you like the stuff that they write, but you really don't care for the person, you know, uh, there's, there's quite a few people like that. <laughs> Yes. You know, in our business. But, but when I read your stuff and like knowing you and have, having followed you, you know, um, I, can, I, I almost, I, I, when I read your books, I hear your voice, you know, and, and I That's hear it. Nice. And Thank you. I can, Thank you. I can't, you know, you're welcome. And I, I hear your voice and, and that's why I enjoy it. Because I, I imagine myself talking to you, even like when we, when we talk to each other on social media, like it's your voice, like the way you write, you, you write the way you speak. And, and it's um, even when we disagree about stuff, or even if I see that you wrote something and I'm like, I, I don't think that, it, I know it's you. So I know where it's coming from. It's not coming from that. It's coming from your heart. And that's how you write. And I think that's why people, anyone who's watching this that hasn't read Designated Hebrew or has read it, you got to, I'm telling you, you got to go out and, and get the update because um, it's Dan Schlossberg that wrote it. So it's going to be exciting. Um, I, I want to ask you, I get to ask, uh, I, 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 always, I always ask people this because I know how I found out about it. But when did you first hear about the pandemic baseball book club? When did you first hear about it? And, and was it an immediate thing that you wanted to be part of it? I discovered it on the internet and I don't quite remember how I discovered it there. But as soon as I discovered it, I contacted Jason Turbo and said, I would love to be part of this. I have two 2020 books. And he said, that would be great. And then I wrote an article about it for Forbes, which gave the pandemic baseball book club some publicity and I interviewed Jason for that and you know it's taken off from there I, I think that you know um, what I like to see you know um, you weren't part of the group when they had their first zoom chat no and we had a, this big zoom chat and it was like at the time I think there was only about 15 people that were in it and um, I remember looking at everyone and it was weird because I only knew a couple of the people, you know, and, and, and I was like, you know, um, is this thing going to work? You know, I wanted to be part of it. Uh, I knew Jason. I had actually interviewed Jason 10 years ago when the baseball coach came, came out. Um, but I didn't really know anybody else. You know, I didn't know Brian. I didn't know Annika. I didn't know. Um, I knew Brian Wright, you know, because Brian had helped me with, Brian had helped me with getting my book published, so I, he didn't know about it. So I said, Brian, you should really join because his book had just come out, the New York Met all time. Yeah. Um, 
But I'm telling you, man, they have done such a fantastic job of yeah. putting together a cohesive unit of people who seem to really understand community, who seem to understand what it's like. You know, there's obviously people like you in the group that are these established authors that have all these networking and, and you know, uh, ability to, oh, I know this guy, call this person up. Or I know this uh, woman, she does publicity, call her up. Um, and that really is the challenge, you know, when you're in this kind of a pandemic. So, uh, you know, you said that, you know, you wrote the story for Forbes, which I read, which was great. Um, you know, like, do you see that? Have you seen that? Have you seen those qualities in this group that, that I just described that, that you feel welcome and you feel that it really is a cohesive group? Yes, very much so. But I'm, I'm still kind of getting my feet wet because I only now I'm starting to get the releases on a regular basis. I just got the release with asking me, you know, answering the question, what was the most embarrassing thing that happened to you promoting your book? <laughs> and it happened only a few days ago to me when I was interviewed by a host from Florida from a radio station who had technical difficulties and couldn't hear himself talk and kept saying to his producer, can you hear me? Can you hear me? He didn't know the name of my book and he didn't know my name. Oh, boy. That's... Yeah. Uh... That's unfortunate. <laughs> unfortunate, Dan. And then at the end, when we were off the air, he gave me his cell phone number and said, when you're down for spring training, come see me. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I, uh, I have, I think, too many to recall. So I don't know. I, that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard. But I like that. I like that, um, that aspect of the club, doing these interviews within the club. Yeah. Uh, I like how we're pushing each other's books. I love how um, all of our books are available. And what's funny, and I'll tell you a funny story, Dan. My book, Gotham Baseball, was in the PD, uh, the Pandemic Baseball Book Club, uh, was in the shop, that bookshop.org was, was already in there. I didn't oh, put good. it in there. Good. You know, I didn't, you know, I guess my publisher put it in there. But I was like so pleasantly surprised and I was like, I did the same thing. I reached out and I said, I've, I've seen you guys on, on, on social media. And I did it because I thought I could help. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons yes. I joined. I felt I could help, you know, I, you know, I'm pretty good with social media. You know, I, I have a bit of a following. And I turned out that all these people that were in this group were way ahead of me. And they were like, oh, but they still said, come on in. Um, do you, do you feel that, um, that the pandemic has, has, in a strange way, even though we're dealing with not having book signings, not having events, but do you think in a strange way that maybe it's helped in some ways? It's helped us because this is the first confederation of authors that I've, I'm aware of. I mean, we used to all be friendly rivals, and now we're more friendly rivals because we're working together. And by working together, there's strength in the collective. There really is. And we're doing things together. In fact, I've done several interviews this week for my book, The New Baseball Bible. And when they ask me at the end, where can you get the book? I owe the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. Uh, and that's fantastic. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's funny. Uh, Joan Ryan wrote about the Pandemic Baseball Book Club the other day for the, I believe it was the San Jose Mercury News. And in it, she, she used that... Um, because what you just said about the book, the book club, she used that quote from Gore Vidal, that every time your friend is successful, you die a little inside, you know, and, and that's, yes. you know, and, and, and look, I, I'm certainly not pure, you know, I felt that way in my life at, at times, you know, where I see someone that I've worked with be successful. Not that I, you know, it's not that I, you know, um, begrudge them their success, but it's like something that you thought of or something that you thought that you could do and to see somebody else do it. Um, I think that that's why this club is so good and so, and, so, and so important for all of us that that feeling has kind of been taken away, that we're here to promote each other and we're here to really kind of get the word out that bookstore, bookshop.org, is really um, going to help all these independent bookstores that, let's face it, are getting killed right now. We have one 
uh, you know, my, my, my newspaper in Rockaway Beach um, that I run, we have a, for the first time in, I don't know, more than a decade, we had an independent bookshop open up. And it was like their grand opening was right around the time that they sh shut everything down. I was supposed oh. to have a book signing there, you know. But they found a way. They got, they became part of bookshop.org. And, you know, and they've been, you know, little by little, uh, they're selling my book. They're selling a, a, a bunch of local authors' books. Um, you are someone that really has done a lot of these events. Um, yes. Have you, have you heard from anyone or been in contact with anyone as a planning process to see if there's anything on the horizon? Actually, not really, because I do a lot of libraries, I do a lot of men's clubs, right. civic clubs, lions clubs, rotaries, things like that. And I do book to assigned in ballparks. None of that is heading. I mean, there are no games and there are no fans, so that ballpark signings are out. Libraries are still closed for the most part. Civic luncheons, that's not happening because there's no indoor dining. Right. So you just have to make do. I really started with this because I wanted a good story for Forbes.com. I'm a national baseball writer for Forbes, as you mentioned. Right. And this is a great story for Forbes, a good business story. No, it is because it's, it's, showing, how, it's showing how people adjust, right? It's showing how people adapt. And if we can't adapt, if we can't adjust, you know, those are the, the people. Look, was I, I was supposed to have my book signing at Foley's. And now Foley's was, as you know, a, a, yes. a casualty of the pandemic. I love that place. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, I, I never thought in a million years. Never. I, I wrote it in my in acknowledgments. Thank you, Sean, for hosting my book yes. launch. And now yes. it's like. You know, when I do my update, I'm going to have to take that part out and fix it somehow. But um, look, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I really enjoyed talking with you. It's been too long. We have to do this again. Yes, um, I enjoyed it too. Thank you. I, I, I'd love to, uh, you know, uh, start our own little hot stove, you know, uh, conversation. Maybe we do it on a more regular basis and we can talk about the NL East race and, and how your Braves are doing and how my Mets are doing. We can yell at each other and throw virtual popcorn fights. Um, it's really a pleasure to reconnect. And uh, I really, my best of luck to you and on both the New York, the new baseball Bible and uh, the designated Hebrew, both of which are uh, available at bookshop.org. Just go to the pandemic baseball book club and uh, folks, and uh, you can get a, uh, not only Dan's books, but certainly read more about Dan and look at, he's, he's got 38 books, so you got a lot of binging to do to, to, to keep up. So uh, thanks, thank, really, thank you so much for joining us today. Mark, thank you, and good luck with cutting baseball. It's a great book. Oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Take care.